Hello chaps, welcome to John Robson Guitar Tuition. I do hope you're well. Uh, today I'm going to show you three really useful little things that you can do, which I learned from this guitar solo. <laughs> Now, if you want to learn a note perfect rendition of that solo you will find a tab in the description box below and in order to give you a little bit of a head start with that here's a slowed down roughly half speed or thereabouts version of the solo <laughs> Hopefully that didn't look too scary. Um, now then, I'm a very firm believer in the old adage of don't just learn the solo, learn from the solo. So let's get into a little bit of that now, starting with a look at how I began to make sense of the notes that Chuck Berry used in the intro solo to Johnny Be Good. Here we go. Okay, let's begin by looking at the notes that are used in the solo. But just before we get into that, um, a little bit of background information on how I was approaching it. Um, I'd already learned a couple of rudimentary scale patterns, well one mainly, uh, which was I think the first one that most people learn which is that one. Um, you know, the obvious kind of stuff that we all learn when we're starting out, all the, all the apprenticeship licks as I call them. And so on. And that lick there seems to fit very well around an E minor context, doesn't it? Um, in fact, I think shaking all over is actually in E minor. But I also um, noticed that I could pick out other tunes on that same group of notes, one of which was this. And that very much all Lang Syne obviously seems to fit kind of around a G major context. So I had one uh, kind of shape that I could use for lead guitar parts that was centred around a, a backing in E minor and the same shape would work for lead guitar parts when the song was more G major centric and it just seemed the obvious thing to do from there on in that I could move that up the, up the neck uh, like I would do a bar chord you know so you'd get this kind of movable shape and you know, I already had a pretty good understanding of um, the notes on the neck. I, I might do another video on how I kind of figured all that sort of stuff out actually, but for now we'll kind of just accept that I did. So I knew that this shape down here, the, off the open strings, would work in E minor or G major. So if I wanted to play in uh, B flat major, like uh, Johnny B. Good, then I know that. Uh, B flat is three frets higher than G. So that's me G major one here. I just move that up three frets. And that, you know, kind of makes sense. Uh, because the first few notes of Johnny B. Good, as I was figuring it out at the time, are that. But it's at that point where I started kind of running into the buffers a little bit because the next note was this one here. Yeah. Or however it goes, but certainly that G sharp A flat note's involved. 
and there were other notes in there that just didn't seem to make sense. Um, by this time I'd figured out that I could play these this first little group of notes like this and that made the um, G sharp note a little bit easier to kind of reach. Um, I didn't understand why it was there but I knew I knew I had to play it. Um, and then other notes started seeming to crop up like this one here and this one here and you know I'm kind of looking at that note and I'm looking at that note and I'm looking at this note and it's starting to kind of look very much like I've got this pattern which is the pattern that I recognize but it's at the wrong fret this is B flat minor surely and I double checked and yes the song is based around a B flat major chord so what seems to be going on here is that Chuck was using bits and pieces of the scale that I would normally think of as fitting the minor chord over the major chord so I decided to conduct a little experiment I recorded on a little cassette player um, using the inbuilt condenser microphone you know as you did in those days um, uh, I recorded a few minutes of just a B flat major chord just going along like that and then thought I'm gonna see if this actually does work and I started playing over the top of that with the minor scale <laughs> And wow, I've just learned how to play blues. Is that how it's done? My God, I didn't know you could do that. Well, now I do. And what Chuck seemed to be doing was mixing in bits and pieces of the B flat major pentatonic with the B flat minor pentatonic. And in order to make those two scales kind of live on the same part of the neck, I had to kind of figure out where these notes from the major would kind of sit on top of these notes from the minor. And I ended up being able to mix those two scales together on the same part of the neck and come up with all the kind of licks that I was hearing in the, I don't know, the Chuck Berry uh, tracks that I was listening to at the time, Stray Cats, uh, what else was I listening to, Dave Edmonds, all these kind of records had licks like that going on in them and um, yeah it just seemed like a big revelation to me and I wouldn't have figured any of this out without looking at the Johnny B. Good solo so there that's what I learned in terms of the um, notes involved in the solo let's now take a look at what was going on rhythmically okay so one little rhythmic device which um, you'll find in various places in this solo is called rhythmic displacement now when I was first learning this when I was I don't know 14 15 years old I wouldn't have recognized the term rhythmic displacement but it's there nonetheless and what it refers to is basically taking a lick and starting it at different points within the rhythm each time you repeat it um, what we're going to do is look at this um, sort of iconic unison bend riff you know the kind of that part of the solo and we're going to break that down into two parts we're going to call it the bent note or the bend and the target note so what he's doing is he's bending a note on this string up to the same note on this string uh, so you got the bend note and the target note let's have a look and see how those notes are distributed across the rhythm so we can see here with a standard eighth note or quaver based count of one and two and three and four and etc that the lick occupies one and a half beats worth of that rhythm 
The bent note lasts for the entirety of the first beat, a count of one and, with the target note lasting for the first half of the second beat, a count of two. Then the lick is repeated, this time beginning on the and of beat two, and once again occupying two eighth notes or quavers, the and three, with the target note landing on the second half of the third beat. Then the lick is repeated again, this time with the bend lasting for the four and count, and the target note landing on the one of the next bar. We continue repeating the lick again, this time it begins on the and of beat one in that second bar, and once again lasts for two quavers, so that's the count of and two, and the target note lands on the and coming before beat three. Then finally the lick is repeated once more with the bent note lasting for three and and the target note landing on four and that second bar is completed with a half beat rest and then it all begins again. Here it is being played and counted at the same time. So hopefully you can see what that whole rhythmic displacement thing is all about. It's a very, very good way um, of making any repetitive lick sound more interesting simply by virtue of beginning it on a different part of the beat each time. Uh, you'll find a similar example um, in the solo to All Right Now by Free. You know the bit where it goes... Um, Like that, it's the that part of it which is using a similar rhythmic displacement device, which is what makes it sound um, interesting and, and not just like you're plodding through the same lick over and over again because you've run out of ideas of what to play. Right, so that is rhythmic displacement. See if you can apply it to any of your own. Um, little repetitive licks that you use. Maybe you're doing so already without even realising it. In which case, see if you can capitalise on that and use it a bit more. Um, next up, we're going to go back to the note choices that uh, Chuck used in that solo. We've mentioned already that he used the B-flat minor pentatonic and the B-flat major pentatonic. And this... Um, combination of scales together adds up really to more than the sum of its parts. It was my introduction to the whole wonderful world of playing modes. Here's a little bit of an explanation. Okay, so here we have the B flat minor pentatonic shown in blue, and as I mentioned earlier, combined and jumbled up with this scale in the solo, we also have the B flat major pentatonic which I've shown in kind of an orangey colour. And if you've ever done a little bit of watercolour painting like I have, then you probably recognise that as being burnt sienna, perhaps? I don't know. Anyway, if we mix those two scales together, we get a nice little hybrid scale like this. And you can see where I've indicated notes that are common to both scales. Now, taking that hybrid scale, here it is. We can extract some other scales from that, starting with this one. This is the B flat Dorian mode. And 
And in addition to that B flat Dorian mode, we can also get a B flat Mixolydian mode. Now I feel it's important for me to stress at this point that again I was about 14 years old when I was figuring all this stuff out and I would not have had a clue what you were talking about if you'd used terms like hybrid scale, pentatonic, mixolydian, dorian. I just kind of knew that there were shapes and patterns that I could kind of glean from uh, this particular solo. I had what I would kind of call a basic minor pattern. <laughs> that I could use over anything that was um, kind of minor chord based, like in this case it would be B flat minor, and I could also use that scale over a B flat major chord to give like a, a bluesy kind of sound, like that. Um, and I also had uh, a, a major set of notes. Um, That would give kind of a major almost like a pop or country type feel over the top of that major chord or a song kind of centered around that chord. Um, I didn't know the terms <coughs> I just knew that I had those two basic groups of notes and if I mixed them together I could get like uh, a slightly um, enhanced version of the minor one Like that, which you know, I could use um, over a, in, in a kind of a bluesy or rock and roll context in the same way I use the minor pentatonic, and it just gave me a few extra notes, a few extra arrows in my quiver, as it were. And then I also had kind of an enhanced major um, kind of group of notes. I don't think I was even conscious that these were called scales at the time. And again, that would give me yet another kind of flavour that I could use. And I was learning other solos and stuff at the time, as I mentioned earlier, stuff like Brian Setzer when he was in the Stray Cats, um, Dave Edmonds, um, Chuck Berry. I was beginning to get into um, blues via Eric Clapton and that kind of stuff and the whole sort of new wave of British heavy metal was kind of pretty big at the time you know Saxon, Iron Maiden, um, Diamond Head and other long forgotten bands and I was beginning to learn solos by these guys and once again I was seeing these same sort of shapes and patterns that I found to begin with in the uh, Johnny Be Good solo by Chuck Berry. So there you go, there are three things that I have learned from the intro solo from Johnny Be Good. Uh, we've got uh, mixing pentatonic scales together, both major and minor, in a kind of bluesy rock and roll context. We've got rhythm, uh, rhythmic displacement, and we've got the first beginnings of a tour into the waters of modes by kind of extracting those um, enhanced groups of notes as I thought of them at the time, the Dorian mode and the Mixolydian mode. Uh, the irony of it is that, you know, kind of years later um, I was reading the guitar magazines when I was kind of a, you know, in the early 20s and kind of reading interviews with the, all the hot players at the time, people like Satriani, Vi, Kirk Hammett, all of those guys, and they were using all these terms like Mixolydian and Dorian and Phrygian and this and the other, and I didn't have a clue what they were talking about until I um, kind of looked at the tabs that were in, that were in the magazines, and suddenly I think, oh, okay, that's what I'm doing. And okay, so that's what it's called, is it? And um, it just helped me to kind of get things a little bit more organised in my mind. 
Right, that's it for today, folks. I hope you found this useful, informative, maybe even a little bit inspiring. If you have, then please hit the subscribe button and that way you'll, way you'll get to see more videos like this. If you would like some tailored one-to-one -one guitar tuition, if you live on Teesside um, in the northeast of England, then get in touch with me via the details at the end of this video. Or even if you don't live on Teesside in the northeast of England, I do also offer lessons via Skype. And whichever um, is your preference, an in-person lesson or a Skype lesson, then your first one is free. So what have you got to lose? As I say, give me a shout and we can sort you out with some uh, tuition. Right, hope you've enjoyed that folks. See you next time. Bye for now.